Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to be with you this morning. It's really good to see you here. And I just want to thank you for taking time out of your regular schedules to come here so we can learn together and, and deal with these shifting landscapes together. So when I look around the room, I see a powerhouse of knowledge about rangelands. Collectively, we study or manage rangelands on the ranch, landscape, and regional scales. And on these scales, rangelands can be considered social ecological systems. How many have heard of social ecological systems before? Okay, so in a nutshell, social ecological systems are complex systems in which the biophysical systems and the human systems are intricately linked and they depend on each other to function. And so in this really simple example here of a social ecological system on rangelands, I'll, I'll show you a simple example. We have biophysical systems, we have human systems. The biophysical systems provide ecosystem services for humans, so carbon sequestration, biodiversity, clean water, view sheds, like the beautiful views you saw driving in here today. And in turn, the humans in this in the social ecological system steward those biophysical systems or try to take care of them for the continued provision of those ecosystem services. So that's a really simple view of a, of a social ecological system. Simplified, not simple, but and resilience is a really important concept when thinking about social ecological systems, especially as we're dealing with so much ecological and social and economic change on those different scales that we manage. And so resilience, um, when folks talk about resilience of a social ecological system or really any system, they're talking about its capacity to absorb um, um, disturbances or yeah, major disturbances in order to retain its essential structure, process, and relationships among system components. So it's really the ability of a system to withstand shock and remain relatively the same in ways that people care about. So some key ingredients for social ecological resilience are self-organization. So groups coming together um, to talk and learn and manage a system that they care about, kind of like we're doing here today. Um, another key ingredient of social ecological res resilience is adaptation. And finally, learning like we're doing here today. So let's run through an example, because sometimes resilience can be a little hard to wrap our minds around without a concrete example. So let's say that this is a, over on the left here, yep, your left too, is a rangeland region, is a rangeland social ecological system. And let's say we all live in that system and we're part of the system. And we really like this system. We like the way that ecosystem services and land stewardship interplay with the biophysical systems and the human systems. We like how the, rain, the region is dominated by rangelands and how folks can make a livelihood from those rangelands, from either from livestock or renewable energy or other um, activities. And we like how the social system on rangelands is linked into the the urban systems in the region. So basically we like the state of affairs in our region. But then a uh, shock hit. So um, in this example that you might be familiar with in your day-to-day -day life, um, the shock is mega drought, a global pandemic and steep price increases of inputs for agriculture and other types of activities on rangelands. So we're hit with this shock and so, we say to ourselves, hey, we like our state of affairs, so we're gonna try to work toward resilience. Um, and so we work towards self-organization, learning and adaptation, so we can retain the essential structures, processes and relationships in our social ecological system. And so we work for resilience, and then what we come out with after this, um, after this shock abates, is a system with a lot of the same relationships and structures and processes. It might look a little different, which is what I was going for with that clever color change there. So, but there's still, we, there's still mostly rangeland, there's livestock on there. We, we, the same relationships of ecosystem service provision and land stewardship. Although some of the, um, 
enterprises will be different. Some of the demographics will be different. It retains its basic structure. So that, my friends, is resilience in a nutshell. Um, and so now that we know a little bit about resilience and we've had a minute to think about it, what's your role in rangeland resilience? Okay, so going back to our model of how resilience works for a rangeland social ecological system, I just wanna bring your attention here, hopefully you can see that, to the role of land stewardship. So this is a really important piece of the structure of the social ecological system that we care about. It's also gonna be integral to all of this self-organization, learning and adaptation in these resilience processes. And I think it's something that a lot of us focus on in this room. So I'm just gonna run over a few approaches to resilience-oriented land stewardship that folks are trying around the world on rangelands um, in pastoral systems all over the world. And so one of these major approaches is adaptive management for rangeland health. And I think a lot of us work in this space. And so this is the idea that we conceptualize these, these variable and diverse rangelands in terms of ecological sites and states. So we look at that shifting mosaic and we try to make sense of it with this framework of sites and states. Um, then we identify departure from the desired condition of those states. So states that we care about, we say, okay, that one is not doing well in terms of soil stability, biotic integrity, and hydrologic function. Um, after that assessment, we implement management options to either resist, accept, or direct change on those states that we're managing. Um, and then, of course, we monitor the outcomes of our management and we adjust it if it's not going in the direction we like. And that's in an adaptive cycle. So that's one of the key approaches to resilience-oriented land stewardship on rangelands. Another major approach is cross-fence line collaboration. So that's stepping out of our comfort zones, kind of like we're doing today, talking to our neighbors, talking to other institutions or across disciplines about solving complex problems together and not going it alone. Um, another key approach for resilience oriented land stewardship is integrating different types of knowledge together. So the integration of traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, along with Western science. That's pretty important the world over. Um, and then another major approach to resilience oriented land stewardship is um, payments for ecosystem services. So this is key. So building these markets for for paying for the services that producers and others um, provide from rangelands is a key is going to be a key approach to resilience. Um, this soil carbon is pictured here and where I think that's on a lot of people's minds and hopefully these markets will build and grow and get stronger as we agree upon how to measure additionality of carbon in the soil on rangelands, which is quite difficult. Um, so those approaches are wonderful. They show results and they're promising, but the spatial and temporal variability of rangelands can really hinder our capacity for these land stewardship approaches. And so we just heard from Niall just about how things have shifted over the past um, decades. And then, you know, we see it every day, every season, every week, how much things change when you live on an, especially on an arid rangeland. And so, in my travels around the West and speaking with other researchers and ranchers and other stakeholders, a lot of questions come up about how to do land stewardship for resilience um, in these variable rangeland landscapes. People say, this is crazy. It's changing all the time over space and time. How can I really do these things? So I was just going to run over a few examples of questions that I've heard. I'm sure you have your own, and we can continue to talk about those through the course of the day. But what's exciting is that this workshop is, is designed to try to start answering some of these questions. So I'll go over the questions, and then we get to hear some possible solution from, solutions from the experts in the field. Okay, so a major question that I hear is, where are the ecological sites and states that are most vulnerable to change? So if I'm managing for rangeland health, um, where, are those, where are those states where I really want to put my attention? And we don't always get a sign from heaven about where to go and like pointing us to those states. So we need, we need other types of tools. 
Um, so I'm managing for live for rangeland health and I'm managing livestock. So a big question that comes up time and time again is where have my livestock been? Where are they now? And how can I best direct their distribution over space and time for this, these resilience goals that I have for my place and my region? <coughs> Sorry, in relation um, infrastructure, the place the placement of infrastructure can really affect that patchy mosaic of vegetation and soils. And so there's a lot of decisions to be made about the placement of infrastructure in a livestock setting. So because the distance to troughs, distance to fence lines, distance to roads can really affect your outcomes of land stewardship. Um, we, and and you know any of us living around here can could probably probably saw a scene like this yesterday. So you're standing somewhere where it's not raining, and then not too far away it's raining. So and we all know that rain um, interacts with soils for the vegetation greenness and the vegetation diversity and the vegetation that we might want to see out there. So it's really important to know where and when it rains so I can plan land stewardship accordingly. Okay, and then when it comes to seasonality, this is when it gets crazy too. So timing of when the vegetation is green and might be growing, it actually changes a lot from year to year. So you can't necessarily expect that green up will happen every year from June, July to August. Um, and that's um, an example that we're seeing this year with some of the later rain. So that's a big question. So how do I plan for, for restoration, for grazing, for other management efforts when I don't even know when it's gonna green up? Um, Another, another question that I hear is, okay, I have this complex problem, maybe about the need for fire or there's an erosion problem. Should I try to manage with my neighbors? But then a, the second question that comes is, who are my neighbors? Because they're, they're they seem to be changing, especially with land use change. This is just south of the Hornada here. And you can see the difference in the housing um, that has come just right at our, our neighbors to the south. Okay, and then in terms of carbon markets, this one gets really complicated because we're learning that if we maintain shrubs on the landscape, that might be our best bet for, for sequestering carbon, maybe not adding additional, but maybe adding additional. Again, we still need to learn or I need to learn. Brandon, I need to learn. But um, so we either maintain the shrubs or um, we get rid of, we remove those shrubs, and then that would be more of investing in our current enterprise and the people who depend on it and remove those shrubs. So that's kind of a trade off type question that comes up quite a bit in these variable and shifting landscapes. Um, those working on the regional scale probably have many questions about the placement of energy developments and how they affect rangelands and communities in that social ecological system. And this kind of question, I'm sure has been asked at every Hornada symposium over our 110 year history. And that's given the projected changes that we see in the future. What's my best bet for planning? How can I make the best plan for my family, for my land, for the resilience of my social ecological system? And so with that, I'm just gonna say, I'm looking forward to hearing from those in the field with a lot of experience exploring these questions and potentially solving them. And so we have the rest of the day to think about solutions. So thank you very much for your time and for being here.